We've been working our way through the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings under the title, I Believe. John writes so that followers of Christ and those that Christ is calling out would believe the right things about Jesus and by repentant believing faith call upon him for salvation understanding that he is indeed the Son of God. As you're finding John chapter 10, page 80 of the New Testament in those pew Bibles, John chapter 10, I want to encourage you to plan to be back next week. We're going to examine the first half of John chapter 10 this morning. And then next Sunday morning as we pick up our study, we'll be answering this question, Can a Christian, once they are saved, ever again be lost? Is a person in Christ totally and eternally secure? Can a person who is ever saved ever again be lost? And in the chance that some of you might not be able to be here next Sunday morning, let me just simply answer that question. The Bible teaches that all that are in Christ are eternally safe. They are eternally secure because we are kept in the grip of God himself. Well, today we're in our 34th lesson, John chapter 10 and verse 1. And I want to borrow one of the titles that Jesus gives to himself in this text and preach for a few moments on this subject, I am the good shepherd. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, would you stand with an open Bible to honor the reading of the perfect, precious, powerful word of God. Jesus begins this little sermon with a phrase that means, Amen, Amen. Your text may say, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and he is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I laid down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my father. A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? May God add a blessing to the reading of his word as we take our seats in the building this morning. Immediately following the miraculous healing of the man born blind that we examined last week in the ninth chapter of this fourth gospel, Jesus embarks on a lengthy discourse about a shepherd and his sheep. In this sermon, only interrupted a time or two by the commentary of the Holy Ghost through the hand of John, Jesus borrows a picture from the culture and simultaneously utilizes a calling card of the Messiah. What I mean by that is that when Jesus is talking about a shepherd and his relationship with the sheep, he's talking to a culture of people who understand what it means to be a shepherd and to have some sheep. And he is also speaking to a group of religious Jews who understand that the title of shepherd, good shepherd, great shepherd, chief shepherd, was one of the titles in the offices of the prophesied promised Messiah. Jesus knew that his audience would know he is being messianic in his tone when he proclaims, I am the door to the sheepfold 
and twice, I am the good shepherd. It is perfectly consistent with the theme for which John writes because John wants us to know who the good shepherd is that we might follow him out of the flock of dead lifeless religion and into the one true fold of God. John's theme verse is in chapter 20 verse 31. We examine it in each study. John declared, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. In our remaining moments this morning, I want us to see and to hear and to know Jesus Christ as the good shepherd. That is to hear his call, to know his voice, to follow his lead, and to be able to leave this service today saying along with another inspired shepherd, King David, that the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus declared, I am the good shepherd, and I want to say I agree with that for three reasons. First of all, I believe he's the good shepherd because of the sound that comes from his lips. I love to hear the voice of my girlfriend, fiance, and then wife as we were dating and courting and bringing our relationship together. And these were the days before cell phones. And you had to, young people, you had to actually pay money to talk to somebody long distance at night. And sometimes you would have to talk to this person called the operator. But I put up with all that and paid the bills because I love to hear the voice of my wife on the phone. I love to hear the voices of my children most of the time. <laughs> but there's never been a voice any more sweet than the voice of the shepherd calling to his sheep. As Jesus is giving this discourse on himself as the good shepherd, he's making a comparison to the way that he calls people out of the lifeless religion of dead ritualistic Judaism he compares that to how a literal shepherd would call literal sheep. In that sound of his voice and the cry from his lips, I want to say a word first about an identifying claim. In verses 1 through 3, Jesus contrasts his ministry with that of other would-be shepherds. He describes those who want to climb in some other way. They are thieves and robbers, but he describes himself as the real shepherd. Now to understand this messianic claim, you have to understand a little bit about the sheepfolds of that day. If you've ever watched western movies, maybe you're familiar with the idea of the livery stable. In that day, people would ride on horses, they would ride on mules, and they would, they would often be driving cattle. And when they would come into the town, the, the, the animals that they were riding, the animals that they were tending, uh, needed a place to sleep as well as the people needed a place to sleep. And they would be put in a livery stable. It was a holding place and you paid rent for a place to keep your horse just like you paid rent for a motel room. The same was true in the days of Jesus when shepherds would transfer their sheep from one community to another. There were community stables. And at night, all the shepherds that were staying in that area would bring their flocks together. And the flocks of one shepherd would be intermingled with the flock of another shepherd. The, the shepherd would pay the, the owner of that sheepfold, the porter, the doorkeeper. He would pay him his wage and then come back in the morning. And you might ask, if you don't know anything about sheep, you might ask, how in the world would the shepherd go about getting his sheep out of that larger flock? Would he go out and did he have an identifying tag? Were they branded as cattle will be branded? They have a tag on their ear? No, the shepherd had such an intimate relationship with his sheep and he knew his sheep even by name that when the shepherd would come in the morning, pay the night's rental wages, he would simply lift his voice and call to his sheep and the sheep would recognize his voice and would come out. Jesus is coming into the sheepfold of dead Judaism. That's been the theme through these first nine and now into the tenth chapter of John's gospel. And he, by his own sovereignty, is going to be calling out truly uh, appointed sheep to be a part of his flock. And the ones that he comes and when he calls, they hear his voice. They will begin to respond and the others will be left in the larger sheepfold. The Jewish audience that historically heard these claims would have understood that Jesus is himself claiming to be the Messiah. Ezekiel prophesied about the coming of the anointed one and said, Then I will set over them one shepherd and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. 
Would you please put the Ezekiel passage up on the screen? Up on the screen, Ezekiel 34. You will notice there that the prophet declared that the Messiah would be a shepherd. Micah said of the Messiah that he would arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. Prophesying about the death of the Christ. The Bible said in Zechariah, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. When Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, they knew that he was declaring, I am the Messiah. And it's one of the reasons that before this little sermon is over in John chapter 10, they are picking up stones with which to stone him. The New Testament writers pick up on this analogy. So Simon Peter calls Jesus the shepherd of our souls. The writer of Hebrews describes him as the great shepherd of the sheep, even Jesus our Lord. And his shepherding ministry will even continue into eternity. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life. Jesus is saying to the Jews that we're looking for God's good shepherd to come. I have finally arrived. Listen to my voice and follow me. Throughout the earthly ministry and the life of Jesus, others would make this same claim. They would testify about Jesus. For example, when Gabriel said to the Virgin Mary that this one conceived by the Holy Ghost shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High God, what he was saying is that the Good Shepherd is coming and when he calls, open the door, let him in and follow him wherever he leads you. When Simeon saw the Christ child just, just a few days old in the temple and he declared, Lord, you may now take your servant home in peace for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, the glory of Israel and a light unto the Gentiles. What he was saying is, Israel, listen up. The good shepherd has come. Listen to his voice and follow his leadership. Over and over again, others would say that he is the Christ. When John the Baptist declared in chapter 1, verse 29, that Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, what he was declaring is he's finally here. Open the door of your heart. Open up your ears. Listen to his call. Follow his voice. He is the good shepherd. It was an identifying claim. But notice also now in verse 3 an individual call. I'm working my way back through John chapter 10. The Bible speaks of this call in verse 3. To him, that is to the real shepherd, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Here again we see a picture of the sovereignty of God in salvation, which is a recurring theme of John's gospel. Namely, that the sheep don't respond until they are called, and the only reason they respond is because the shepherd made a call, and they heard the sound of his voice. It's worth noting also the Bible says he calls them by name. Aren't you grateful to know that if you're one of God's sheep, listen church, he not only knows us as a group, that is, he knows our church, he knows the individual members of the true church and calls you by name. When I was a little boy in the Sunday night service and the preacher preached the gospel, the voice of the Holy Ghost, the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ did not say, number 2997437, I want you to be saved. No, the same God that knows the numbers of the hairs upon my head, which is getting a lower number each and every day. The same God that not only flung the stars into their galaxies, but, but knows them by name. The same one knows me by name. He knows you by name. Listen, every burden that you carry, every trouble that you have, every sorrow that you're toting around this morning, he knows about it because he knows about you and knows everything about you. Calls out his sheep by name. The last time I went over to the state patrol office in person to renew my driver's license, there was only one other person in there, only one other customer that was in there, and I walked in and they told me to take a number. <laughs> I looked around thinking, where's the crowd? And when they finished dealing with the person who was in front of me, the clerk behind the counter said, number 12, 
That's when you know you're at a place run by the government. I'm glad that Jesus doesn't treat us that way. Oh no, he calls us by name and we respond in turn by calling on his name. Jesus called my name and so I called upon his name. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He issued an identifying claim. I'm the Messiah. He issued an individual call and he's calling out a flock unto himself. That's all because of something we see in verses 4 through 6, and that is an intimate connection. The Bible says, beginning in verse 4, when he puts forth all his own, that is, when, when he's called out all of those that are truly his, he does something. He goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now, they won't do this for a stranger. No, they will flee from him, verse 5, because they do not know the voice of strangers. It's worth noting that Jesus doesn't drive his sheep because shepherds aren't driven, or sheep aren't driven. You drive cattle, you lead sheep. Cattle are driven from the back with a whip. Sheep are led from the front with a staff, a rod, and an example Later in this chapter, in verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I want to ask this morning, how could we not follow the voice of our shepherd? How could we not cry out this morning, Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me. So how could we not, when every time we followed him, do you know what he's done for us? He's led us by the quiet waters. He has guided us to green pastures. He set a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He has anointed our heads with oil. Because we're following Jesus, goodness and mercy are going to follow us all the days of our life, and we will dwell in the house of the shepherd forever and forever. Because we know him and he knows us. A well-known actor made a lot of money putting on presentations for, for the wealthy and the famous. This actor had an eloquent voice and a tremendous memory. And one night he was putting on a dinner theater and he challenged the audience. He said, if you name any great work of literature, I'll be able to quote significant portions of it. Name anything you want to. And after quoting from... Some of the writings of Shakespeare and the Gettysburg Address and things of that nature. An old man raised his hand and said, could you quote the 23rd Psalm? And the actor cleared his voice and with beautiful tones he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he meticulously quoted that great psalm from the King James translation of the Bible. After he finished, the audience erupted into applause. And then the actor asked the old man who had requested the psalm, he said, can you quote Psalm 23? The elderly man came to the platform, took the microphone, and he said, I must admit, my memory is not as good as it used to be. But I do remember this. When I was a little boy, my preacher preached the gospel. And I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior, my Lord. That day he became my shepherd. And because of that I've lived my whole life and I've never really needed anything. In times of need he calls me to lie down in green pastures. Times when I was empty he restored me. When there was crisis and calamity in my life he led me beside a quiet brook. There have been times in my life when I was tempted to sin but he led me in the path of righteousness. And he did it not because I'm a good person, but because he's a good shepherd. He did it for the sake of his own name. Like you, I've had critics in my life, but the shepherd has made me safe even in their presence. He's anointed my life with goodness. In fact, we old timers say it like this, I'm now drinking from my saucer because my cup is overflowing God has been merciful to me and that's why even though I'm now an old man and my own death is imminent I have no fear 
This shepherd that has walked with me all the days of my life is going to walk with me even through the valley of the shadow of death. And the same goodness and mercy that has sustained me every day of my life will carry me into the great heavenly sheepfold of my shepherd for I will live with him forever. And as he sat down, the actor took the microphone back and said, It is obvious, is it not? I know the psalm. He knows the shepherd. I ask you this morning, do you know the shepherd? Have you responded to his voice? Have you heard the sound from his lips? Oh, he's a good shepherd. Secondly, because of the safety in his leadership. It becomes obvious in verse 6 that the audience did not understand Jesus' analogy. And so as a good teacher, Jesus says the same thing, but he says it in a slightly different way. Teachers understand how to read the facial expressions or body language of your students. You understand when they're not getting it. So Jesus stays in the general theme of being a shepherd, but he takes a slight little twist upon it. Now, instead of being the shepherd that comes to the vast intermingled flock and calls out his own, Jesus now describes himself as the door to one single sheepfold. In this context, Jesus picks up in verse 7, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear him. Look in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. That tells me first that when we respond to his leadership, we are safe because he pardons. If anyone will enter in by this door, he will be saved. Saved. I don't know if there's a more beautiful word than all the Bible than this one, saved. Now that's saying a lot because there are some beautiful words in the scriptures. Redeemed, grace, faith, reconciled, forgiven. <clears throat> but there's none of them any more beautiful than this word saved. And Jesus said, I'm the door to God's sheepfold. If you want to be saved, you've got to enter in by me. Friends, this speaks of what we call the exclusivity of Christ, that there is only one way to be saved. Now, when people balk at that great doctrinal truth, I just answer it by saying this. When I look at my life that I am completely dead in trespasses and sins, I don't deserve to be saved. I deserve to go to hell forever, that even my best day apart from Christ deserves the righteous wrath and the holy condemnation of God listen to me church when I look at myself and if you will genuinely look at yourself it won't bother you that there's only one way to be saved you'll just be glad that there is a way and Jesus said I am that way I am that truth I am that life and no one comes to the father except through me and here using this shepherd's analogy he says I am the gate into the sheep pen I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. G. Campbell Morgan was a great British evangelist and pastor from the early 1900s. And he tells the story in one of his sermons about traveling with a friend of his, Sir George Adam Smith. And Sir George was once traveling in Australia and tells the story of encountering an Australian shepherd. And after talking to the shepherd about his particular profession, the shepherd asked the great preacher, Do you, would you like to see my sheepfold? He said, I would love to. And he went and he noticed that the sheepfold was almost completely encircling the sheep. A stone wall about three feet tall. But he noticed that there was no gate on the opening. There was no door going into the sheep pen. And Sir George asked the shepherd, Why is there not a gate on this sheep pen and the Australian shepherd not a believer not speaking theologically but just speaking professionally said I am the gate what do you mean you are the gate of course the preacher familiar with John 10 wanted to hear it from the from the professional side of the shepherd what what do you mean you are the gate and he responded at night when all of the sheep are in the pen I lay down across that opening and no sheep is getting out without me knowing about it and no wolves are getting in without me knowing about it. And as long as I'm alive, are you with me? 
as long as I'm alive, none of the sheep in the pen are getting out, and none of the wolves outside the pen are getting in. The only way any wolf outside is getting in and a sheep inside is getting out is over my dead body. Now, folks, you want to talk about safety? When we were called by the Holy Ghost into the sheepfold of God, we are secure in Christ, secure with Christ, secure by Christ. Nothing can come against the sheep of God unless it crawls over the dead, lifeless body of Jesus. But may I remind you, the gatekeeper, the very gate of God's sheepfold is one who was dead but is now alive forevermore. All the safety of following Jesus, he pardons. Then we also see in verse 9, he provides. Verse 9 says, if you enter by this door, you will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Simply put, those who come by the way of the cross of Jesus Christ can say along with King David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or perhaps with the great hymn writer, all I have needed, not everything I've wanted in the flesh, are you listening? But all I've genuinely, truly needed. Thy hand hath provided. He pardons. He provides. And then he protects. Look in verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Very often when you read John 10, 10, you get the idea that the thief is the devil. I believe that the thief is ultimately the devil, but specifically Jesus is talking about the thieves and robbers, the false teachers, the false prophets, and the dead system of ritualistic Jewish religion. And he's saying, if you follow that way of thinking, it's going to kill you. It's going to destroy you. It's going to steal away your life. But if you'll follow me, I'll give you life. And that more abundantly. In Matthew 9, Jesus described lost people as sheep without a shepherd. But I'm not lost. You know why? I've got a shepherd. And you know why I can never again be lost? It's because even in moments of my own spiritual stupidity and disobedience, when I wander away from the fold and venture away from the flock, my good shepherd is also a great shepherd. He's also the chief shepherd. In fact, Simon calls him the chief shepherd and guardian of our souls. And my good shepherd will leave the 99 in the sheep pen and he will go find me, maybe in the rocks of rebellion, on the cliffs of carnality. He will find me in the muck and mire of my own sin. And you know what he'll do? He will run me down, break my leg if he has to, strap me up across his big strong back and carry me back where I belong to be. Jesus does these things in our life because he is protecting us. That's why the hymn writer said, I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray, threw his loving arms around me, and drew me back into his way. Jesus is the good shepherd because of the sound from his lips, because of the safety from his leadership. By the way, as a footnote, there are lots of other shepherds out in the world. And they shepherd bad flocks. Jesus is declaring here that if you... I don't know if, I don't know if sheep get a wild hare. Do they get a wild wool? You get you a wild wool and start following after another shepherd... Jesus is saying you better pay attention now because that shepherd doesn't love you like I love you. That shepherd is in it for what he can get out of you. And that shepherd is going to fleece you. That shepherd is going to abuse you. And you say, well, I just think I'll venture off. I've got me an old wool-brained idea. I'm just saying if you're listening... I think I'm going to go off and live in this other little fold for a while. I'm going to get out, for example, out from under the protection of my godly mama and my righteous daddy. I'm not going to listen to my 
pastor. I'm going, to, I'm going to disavow the counsel of the staff at my church. I'm going to go my own way. Jesus would affirm here what the Bible says in Proverbs. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. You get to running with the wrong flock, and you're going to find out that shepherd came for a reason, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But oh, you'll never regret following the safety of the leadership of the good shepherd. Third reason I believe he's the good shepherd, and that is because of the sacrifice of his life. The good shepherd is preaching to his sheep about a day that is coming in which he will lay down his life for them. While most shepherds in that day led their flock with a staff and a rod, Jesus is going to lead his flock with a blood-stained cross of sacrifice. He speaks of this in verses 11 through 21. Notice, first of all, the contrast that he provides. Verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But now he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who's not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Here again, Jesus is reminding his audience, no one will ever love you and care for you like he does. The great preacher James Montgomery Boyce comments on these verses and says, We must never think, as we contemplate the death of Christ, that this death was somehow an accident or worse yet, a tragedy. He says it was the greatest turning point in history planned before the foundation of the world. Jesus is talking about thieves and robbers, and now he says hirelings. Folks who will run when times get tough. But Jesus is wanting his sheep to know that far from running scared when times get tough, he is going to literally lay down his life for his sheep. There's the contrast that he provides. Then I want to say a word about the cross that he prophesies. In verses 14 through 17, Jesus continues to speak about the laying down of his life. In fact, five times in these few verses, he prophesies about the cross by using the phrase, laying down his life. Get the picture. A hireling, someone that doesn't love the sheep, who's only tending the sheep because of the day's wage, sees the wolf coming and says, I'd rather give up my day's pay than to give up my life. He doesn't own the sheep, doesn't care about the sheep, doesn't love the sheep, but not so with the good shepherd. When the good shepherd sees danger coming, he steps in front of it. When the good shepherd sees the wolf, he will lay down his life fighting that wolf. Is that not what Jesus did for us? You see, from before the very foundation of the world, Jesus knew that we were helpless and hopeless. We couldn't save ourselves if we wanted to. Wouldn't want to save ourselves if we could. And because of our sin, listen to me. Listen, church, pay attention. Don't let the familiarity of this story lull you into a state of apathetic listening. Because we could not help ourselves, Jesus knew in our sinful state we were the just recipients of the wrath of God. Seeing that his sheep were in danger of the wrath of the Father, Jesus went to an old rugged cross and took that wrath upon himself. We deserve death. Jesus died in our place. We deserve the wrath of God. Jesus bore it in our body. We deserve to be crushed under the weight of divine justice. Jesus from the cross essentially said, Father, crush me and let my sheep live. The good shepherd doesn't run. No, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. There's the contrast he provides, the cross he prophesies, and then the conquest that he promises. I'm in verse 17. For this reason the Father loves me. Because I laid down my life. Are you looking at verse 17? Aren't you glad it doesn't end there? I laid down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it away from me. I lay it down of my own initiative. I've got authority to lay it down. And here it is again. And I've got authority to take it up again. Now follow the analogy. 
even a good shepherd. I'm talking about a literal, physical shepherd. If he were ever called upon to lay down his life for the sheep, that might help the flock in that moment. But in some, in some aspects, that could be the worst thing to ever happen to that flock. The shepherd lays down his life <clears throat> for one little lamb. And now the rest of the wolf pack is free to prey upon the rest of the flock. When a shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep, it was an act of nobility, but it ultimately endangered the rest of the flock. The wolf or the other predator would come into the flock, snatch off one, the rest of the flock would be scattered, only to be picked off one by one as the day wore on. But here's what Jesus did for us. He went to the cross, bore the wrath of God against our sin in his own body. But after laying down his life of his own initiative, our good shepherd didn't stay dead. I've come today to remind you of what you already know, that on the third day after his crucifixion, our good shepherd rose from the dead. That's why we have a good shepherd. Listen, church, because low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. But you know what he did? Up from the grave he arose and because of that we can trust in the goodness of our shepherd the story is told of a little girl who was going to VBS and that week she was to learn the 23rd Psalm she was going to recite it in the service at commencement night and that night she got up with the microphone and you know all the cameras were rolling and these days they'd have their iPads and iPhones out and she stood up there in front of the church with her roughly dressed, you know, picking her nose and showing her Wonder Woman underoos. And she got nervous. She knew all six verses of that great psalm. But in the nervousness, she said, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And right now, that's all I know. <laughs> Friends, if you know the good shepherd, that's enough to know. Let's pray. As our heads are bowed in prayer, I want to ask you this morning, do you know this shepherd and does he know you? Has he called to you and have you responded? It is possible that this morning the good shepherd is calling out some of his sheep. And I ask you today to respond to his call of salvation. Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Have you trusted in Christ as Savior, Lord, and God? Do you know for a fact that he is your Lord and your Savior? Do you know for a fact that you've got a right relationship with God? In just a moment, we're going to stand to our feet. And if you're here without a personal relationship with Jesus, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat, whether you're on the floor or in the balcony. All these aisles lead down here to the front. The staff members of our church will be here to receive you, to pray with you, and talk to you about what it means to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Others are here this morning, and you need to come and unite with this church or follow the Lord in baptism. Maybe you want to come to this place of prayer and just talk to the shepherd for a little while. Father, would you in superintend this invitation? Guide your sheep to the response you're calling them to make. And may we respond with simple obedience. In Christ's name I pray, amen.